Hello. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our early 9 a.m. service. It really is 9 o'clock, right? You know, this is sort of a nice time. You want to just keep it at 9? So, so, so. I want to make sure everyone can hear me. We are trying to get the sound so we still, some folks still say they're having trouble hearing and we want to make sure as much as you want to hear, you can. Can you hear me okay? It's low. You're telling me it's low. Is that louder? Better than last week. Well, how's that? Is that better? You have to yeah. just, we just, folks at home, how's that sound? All right. Let's wave. Carl will wave. All right. Um, some of this we, we, we adjust as we go. All right. So please, if you can't hear, let me know. Uh, and uh, thank you. So welcome once again to Sayville Congregation of the United Church of Christ, where we like to say, not just to say it, but because we, we feel it deeply in who we are, that you are welcome here long before you arrive. And that's not just folks who come here for the first time or early in the times they're coming to visit us, but for each person who comes here each week, it is, it is such a welcome um, event to see you all, to see Robert come walking in in the back with that hat on. Hi, Robert. How are you? And, and Justin, who comes in. Hi, Justin. So, so welcome during this time of uh, all sorts of things going on, which we will continue to pray as, as we do each week, bringing our prayers with us as we prepare to enter into worship together. Welcome back, Kathy. The bell is yours. I would like to dedicate this to the memory of my mother, Frances Coronia Caesar, who died March 2, 2000, and first heard this melody played on a cornet in the Goldman Band in Central Park about 75 years ago.
Please remain seated, joining me in to reading today's unison prayer together. God has never, will never desert us. God is our protector with us, around us always. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which means we are eternally connected to one another. Each of us loved by God love being our common bond. Whichever ways or directions we move, we remember this God of all motion and time. We ask for help and give thanks for an ever-present God, a God of radical hospitality and love. Radical hospitality is, is Jesus and others who have stepped forward into space and time for justice and love, for truth and compassion, for making sure to the best of their ability that the darkness doesn't overshadow the light, which of course it never does because there are always people who are there to make sure that doesn't happen. And above that is a God who loves us and assures us that it never will. This is a place of remembering such things. And with that in mind, I'd like to bring up some of the promises of that assurance in the young people here with us today. Would you like to come up? I see nodding heads. Come on up, folks. Uh, okay. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's the wrong season. Hi there. Hey, Jay. Hey. What are you doing? Jay, Jay. In case we need it, okay? 
How are you? Hello, good morning. Now, what's your name again? Lulu. Lulu. That's Lulu and JJ and Abigail. But we don't, you like Abby these days? What do you like to be called, Abigail or Abby? It's okay, either one. What about you? What do you like? You don't care either. Okay. How about you? All right. Just, just don't call me Baggy. Um, do you know what? Today we're talking about the inside of ourselves. Yeah, well, it's hard to get down there that way. So the best thing to do is to sort of think about you know, who we are inside sometimes. Like if I tickle you, you laugh. And we're, we're happy, joyous people inside. But sometimes we're surprising. So do you remember, this is, this is my favorite. Let me show you. Come here. This is my, one of my favorite books. We've seen it before. I'm, I'm not going to go through it all the way. But it's called, Oh. Oh. And it's about surprises that can happen inside and outside. So watch this, JJ. Jay. Okay, he'll come back. He wants to slide. I thought I had control. Um, so O is a story about, what do you see? You see a hand. JJ, what do you see? What's this, a hand? Yeah, well what happens when I do this? What do you say? Oh, it looks like a what? It's a dinosaur. It's not giving a dinosaur away. Gee, what makes you say that? Tail. Oh, the tail. I'm always learning. What about this? What is that? A teacup. You sure now? Oh, lots of surprises, right? And so this is a great book. It has all of these sorts of little drawings in it. I like each to bring it up sometimes. What's that? A fish. What's that? Fish. What's that? Duck. Duck. Quack, quack, quack. Do you know duck that flies upside down quacks up? <laughs> there are some other surprises. What's in here? Uh, eyes. Eyes? Okay. Open it up, would you? Let's see what's in there. Just give it a good open. Surprise! I knew you wouldn't mind. Isn't that cool? So there's things inside that are always good to remember. And when we have our little gatherings here, and when we go with Bernie inside, and, and we sit together, but especially for all of you young folk, you know what's most important about inside? Is that our love inside of us loves the love inside of you. And that we all get that from from the God that we come here to remember in all the ways we do. And I have something for you to remember today. Would you like something? Uh-oh. I think you gave him a dinosaur. Um, look what I have for you. What's the animal that always remembers? Elephant. Elephant. So I have some little elephant dolls that a friend of mine, there's an organization called, this is not a plug, but it's, it's called Until There's a Cure, and it was started during the AIDS crisis to work for a cure for AIDS. And um, I've been friends with the folks that do it for a long time, and this is one of the pieces they get from some of the countries they support. So I have elephants in red, brown, and it looks like a green. Is there one you'd like? You like this color? Sure. What would you like, Val? Here, what would you like? Anyone? Okay. Did you know that? Shall we pray? Would you like to pray? Would you pray for us? Okay, Abigail, you got the mic. Dear God. Dear God. Love you. Love you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. And now, let us take that love and that prayer and offer one another a sign of peace as you are comfortable offering that sign of peace this morning, okay? And then y'all go off with Bernie. All right, folks, thank you very much. Sorry about that. <laughs> I gotta have it back, though.
Our reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the son of humanity. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of humanity be lifted up, that whoever believes in this one may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave God's beloved so that everyone who believes in this one may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not do this to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved. I apologize for the errant masculine pronoun, if you notice. We do our best. So welcome once again. And today, Nicodemus. <clears throat> Nicodemus. Did you know the origin of the word Nicodemus is Greek? It comes from Nike and Demos. And it means victory. What? <laughs> Running what? Well, it, it stands for victory of the people. Nike stands for victory. Demos stands for people. So it's clear that his parents had high hopes for him when they named him, didn't they? And along with today's story, Nicodemus is, has two other places that he shows up in the Bible we're gonna to touch upon. One is in a meeting with the Sanhedrin of which he was a part, and then the second, Anybody know where else Nicodemus shows up towards the end of John? In the tree. Where? In the tree. In the tree? So there may be four places. <laughs> he shows up at the point where he's with Joseph of Arimathea, the secret disciple of Jesus, who helped to apply the spices and the balms and preparing Jesus' body for the tomb. Nicodemus was there at the end, so we'll come back to that in a minute. Now, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, and so some of this language is going to be coming up quite a bit in the next several weeks, because we're entering, in some ways, into the legal system of the time. So we're going to hear the words Pharisees, Sadducees, Sanhedrin, and so forth. So the Sanhedrin, it meant, in Aramaic, basically Hebrew, it meant sitting together, or an assembly, or a council. 
And in, the, in that time, there were two groups of assemblies, Sanhedrin. There was the lesser Sanhedrin, and then there was the greater Sanhedrin. And they were made up of 23, either 23 or 71 um, members, elders, rabbis in the, San, in the Sanhedrin. And essentially, the, the lesser Sanhedrin were these, like our circuit courts. Every city in ancient Israel had a Sanhedrin, a lesser Sanhedrin. And then there was the greater Sanhedrin, which would be tantamount to something like our Supreme Court. And the greater Sanhedrin met every day to hear things. And so Nicodemus was a part of this group. Now, all of this took place during what's known as the Second Temple Period. The second temple period is the temple that was built after the first one was destroyed. And it was, let's see, I have the dates here, from 516 before the Common Era, era to 70 in the Common Era, this temple stood. Now, it was destroyed in the Jewish Wars. And that was the last time the temple was built. But the thing that's sort of interesting here to keep in that particular temple, which in that, in that background there, that tall part of it, was the innermost part of the temple. It was what is referred to as the Holy of Holies. It's where the ark was and the remnants of the tablets. It was the most sacred of all places um, in the Hebrew and the world of Judaism. So when the temple was sacked and destroyed, it was a lot more than just a building. Um, so there was a lot going on. If, if you think about this, Jesus died somewhere around 30 in the common era, right? So within 40 years, the temple was going to be destroyed after having been in existence for almost 600 years. So we were on, we were on a, a timeline of decline and controversy and conflict and destruction. It was an intense period of time. And during this period of time, there were certain sects that grew up during this temple. Uh, second temple period, among them the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, and the Christians. So this life of Christ that we study and listen to and read about was not happening in isolation. It was happening in the midst of great conflict. Um, let's see. That's off the wall. The Sanhedrin, the last Sanhedrin or group disbanded around 425 in the Common Era. That was about the same time as something else was taking hold. From our studies in, in Bible Jam and perhaps what you know, in the 400s was when Constantine came to power and this pressure and exertion and even oppression towards the Jewish community became more and more to the degree where the Sanhedrin finally disbanded in the early 400, the early 5th century. One of their last acts was to um, drop the Hebrew calendar. And just because this comes up too, Anno Mundi. Idea? What it means? Anno Mundi? Hmm? In the year of the world, it's also a very well-known Italian singer. Now, I don't, I don't know if that's true. So. It's the year, and it's the year that the that the rabbis and the scholars believe that the Earth, God created the world on October sixth at sundown, in the year thirty-seven sixty-one before the Common Era. So if you add twenty twenty onto that it would come up to 5781. We're actually in the year 5770, 5780, because we're, we're coming to the close of the year and then it will be 81. So this is how we get from this period of time, how we get this BCE, CE, and Jewish year and so forth. But that was their last act to, to shut down um, the calendar and to move more towards the Julian calendar. So, a couple of quick words about what is a Sadducee, what is a Pharisee, because they're going to be coming up. 
The Pharisees and the Sadducees were both religious sects within Judaism during the time of Christ. Both groups honored Moses and the law, and they both had a measure of political power. As I said, the Sanhedrin was comprised of both Pharisees and Sadducees. The differences between the two is that the Pharisees were a little bit more uh, interpretive of the law. They believed in the oral tradition. So they believed in when they talked about what the Bible meant, what the Torah meant, that that had important meaning. The Sadducees were a lot more literal translation. Um, so those were pretty much their, their two differences. But even then, interesting, isn't it, that there's this sort of literal translation, interpretation of the word uh, attributed to God and a more interpretive translation of the word of God, perhaps one that comes more deeply from inside on including our own experiences. And uh, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. So he would have been more in that interpretive side. So it starts to make sense why he would come to Jesus as he did and ask questions about, well, well tell me more. Tell me more. So Nicodemus visits Jesus in the middle of the night. Um, following that visit, as I said, there were two other places in the Bible where he comes up. He has a meeting with the Sanhedrin, where after his meeting with Jesus, at some point, he evidently addresses the Sanhedrin, and he reminds them of their responsibility to hear from the accused before they sentence or judge. And then the third time was at the end in John. And this is what John says. Um, in those verses from chapter 19 verses 39 through 42 the last time we hear of Nicodemus it says Nicodemus who had first come to Jesus at night came now in the broad daylight carrying a mixture of myrrh and aloes about 75 pounds they took Jesus's body and following the Jewish burial custom wrapped it in linen with the spices there was a garden near the place he was crucified and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been placed. So because it was Sabbath preparation for the Jews and the tomb was convenient, they, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, placed Jesus in it. There's a lot of uh, questions about who was Nicodemus, old or young. Not sure. Some say he was born actually one year, well, he was born in 1 BCE, before the Common Era. So if we go back and say that Jesus was actually born in 4 BCE, because Jesus was alive when Herod was alive, and Herod died in 4 BCE, which is when Joseph and the family returned. So they were about the same age, according to some. He was reputed to be a holy man, and he was also someone who was believed to be able to do miracles. So he was, he was there. Was he a seeker? Well, one would think so. And so it's easy to imagine this, this holy man, perhaps, this miracle doer, perhaps, this um, in person who interpreted the Bible based on deep thought and experience rather than literal interpretation. You can see him going to Jesus and saying, Jesus, how do you do this? Teach me. How do you do the things you are reported to do and the things we have seen with our own eyes? So the reading is very familiar. And, and I guess the question that we might ask is, well, why did Nicodemus even go to Jesus? And, and maybe that's not so hard to understand, but why in secret? And the second one is actually easier, I think, because, because of his status and his position being seen with Jesus might have affected both and his credibility. In fact, Jesus even seemed to challenge Nicky, as his friends called him, <laughs> and said to him, Are, aren't you a teacher? You ask me these things. Aren't you a teacher, a rabbi? Aren't you a member of the Sanhedrin and you're, you're judging and ruling on people and you don't know about the things you're asking me? You're helping others and you don't understand what it means to be born from above? 
And the word for that is anothen, A-N-O-T-H-E-N, anothen, born from above. Now, maybe all that's true, and maybe Jesus was just a little bit harsh on Nicodemus, you know. We are all a little harsh from time to time. But the other question that really might have been on Nicodemus' mind more than anything else is he wanted to know something. He wanted to know how can I do more? How can I be better? To have more power to change things, to make people more faithful in their lives, to stop all the terrible things that come to us in the courts each day that we have to judge on, the horrible pain and worse that people foist upon each other. How do I, how do we, Jesus, change this? Well, welcome to 2020, Nicodemus. Victory of the people. Still more than a name and still more than just a challenge. So let's change it up a bit. Let's say that Jesus, we, we have some information about how the conversation followed from there. And uh, so it went something like this. Jesus to Nicodemus. Hey, dude, you already got this stuff in you. Be where you are. That's the first one. Be where you are. Quit running around all these other places trying to find something. Stop. Remember Psalm 46.10? Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Stop. Get out of the darkness. Quit living in these places with nothing but shadows and doom and catastrophic thinking and the terrible, horrible things come out of the darkness and find your own presence of God. Find God in you. What is that? Find that. Give it some thought. Be open to it being more. And remember this, you are not of this world. And pray. Pray, thinking, how will I be comforted and able to bring comfort to others in a world such as this? And then remember you are born from above, not below, not the shadows. Rely on what is within you from above. Below. Well, that's all nice. And what does it mean? Well, some thoughts. Look inside yourself. Not as a checklist or a report card to assess your chances for eternity but where you, we, might see ourselves in God's love, God's light. We need to be able to travel in the shadows without being overcome by them. We need to be able to travel in the shadows without being, a, being overcome by them. We need to be sad without thinking the rest of our lives are going to be sad. We need to be able to look at challenges and problems without thinking that's all there's ever going to be. We need to be able to move through the shadows with who we are, God's love and God's light, and know that God is with us. Do not be afraid. And this, I thought. Find ways to admire yourself. Find ways to admire yourself. Be reflective in a positive way. See goodness in yourself. Be aware of what needs to be changed, of course, but don't let that detract from yourself and your goodness. And then this, God is within and without. 
the Nicodemus makes the typical uh, mistake, perhaps, where he looks at Jesus and Nicodemus compares his insides to Jesus' outsides. He doesn't stop and think about his own insides. He's looking at others and saying, oh, if only I could be like you. Now, in the case of Jesus, that's a good model, but still, we're not all supposed to be Jesus. We're supposed to be who we are. So God within and without, not just without. See God in all things. Try to. Even in the upsetting things, God is there too. And God is in the collective joy that we share, whether we're going like this to one another, or like this to one another and passing a piece, or hugging. There is collective joy that is more powerful than anything that might try to put it down. And then this part is really, we know this here. Bring the comfort we find in ourselves to others. That's the assurance of God's love. When we can take the goodness and the comfort we find in ourselves and share it with others. And sometimes all that is, is just being with others. Just be who you are. Be present. Don't look for an answer. Don't look to fix something. Don't look for a solution. Be. The other things will come along, but they're not the first things. And then last on this little list is remember we are of God. We do the legwork, God does the rest. I said to someone the other day, it might have been in Bible Jam, we were reading Desiderata. No, we were reading Patient Trust from Taylor de Chardin that I've used before. And it said, you know, trust in the slow work of God. <clears throat> uh, do not try to be today what only God in time can make you tomorrow. And one of the questions was, well, you know, I, I'm not going to just give up and not do anything. No, well, that's not it. We have to do everything we do. We have to do the legwork. But we do it from a place of knowing who we are and then trusting that in that relationship with God of who we are and who God created us to be, that our legwork will be followed by God and God's work in ways that we can't do ourselves. That old saying, God, we will discover that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. So in closing thoughts, I think Nicodemus did listen to Jesus, whatever it was that followed the conversation that's recorded for us. Maybe it was the voice inside that he trusted with others who found themselves in opposition with the moral literal of their colleagues. Maybe he finally said, you know what? This is a valid way to look at the Tanakh and the gospel. This is an important way. Maybe I can have confidence in that, rely more upon it. Maybe that's what Jesus was telling me. Maybe it was in listening to others. Maybe I have to listen more instead of thinking so more about who I am, what I am, where I'm going, how I'm going to get there, all of these things. Maybe, too, I need to pray a bit more. And maybe just remembering over and over his talk with Jesus and that he was already a no thin. He remembered what we might remember, that we all are born again from above in the spirit. If we just give ourselves the baptism to remember who we are. So whatever it was, it seems that when the time came for Nicodemus following his meeting with Jesus, he knew what to do when the time came to do what needed to be done. He spoke up in that Sanhedrin for others. Maybe that wasn't such a small thing. He was there with Joseph of Arimathea when the time came to bury Jesus. And I don't think in his talk with Jesus that Jesus says, okay, Nicodemus, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go to the Sanhedrin, you're going to say this, you're going to be there when I'm crucified. Nicodemus somehow knew when it was time to do things like we do. Maybe coming out of the shadows is that, you know? Maybe coming out of the shadows is being able to say, okay, when it's time to do what needs to be done, I'll know how to do it. I trust in that. And that starts with the daily things. You know, so many things we get up and we just do without thinking, but that's coming out of the shadows too. 
And for those moments when it takes a little more time to remember who we are, to step out of the shadows, but maybe it's a little easier just to stay there. So most of all, if I can leave you with anything today, I would like to leave you with this thought. Y'all already born again. Y'all, y'all, you're all born again. I know that from the spirit, no matter how you interpret the Bible, you're all born again. And we just have to sort of remember and maybe relearn a bit what that means. And when I wrote these last words, I thought of Randall sitting there. And I was going to say, and look directly at him, and it means to practice that. Because Randolph reminds him, this is us. This is a practice. May it be so. serving in Southwest Asia, may they safely return to their homes and loved ones.
is Jessica, who tomorrow is having a baby. Okay. Yeah. And I've been asked to share uh, from the mailers that they are well and they appreciate all the prayers. I spoke with Jerry and um, Shirley yesterday, and they, they say thank you for the prayers, not only for them, but for all the folks in Nashville suffering from this. For all those who are ill that we continue to pray for, um, for a containment of this spreading virus in some way that can be discovered more quickly. For the welcoming of people, um, regardless of how they love one another, we're continuing to see more and more examples of in the last recent, most recent case, a person who identified as transgender who was Miss Staten Island being refused the um, permission to march in the Staten Island St. Patrick's Day Parade, really. So, and that's just an, an indication of a continuing important ministry that we have here in the way that we welcome all, all, all. Prayers for uh, Brian Hosey and Sal and Winsong in Florida as Brian continues his rehab following the uh, amputation below his knee of his leg. Um, and his picture on Facebook showed the strength of his spirit. And to Carl and Frank, who will be returning to us shortly, to Irish, who is on her way back here with Pat, I believe, as we speak. And to my friends in, uh, in Utah, my friend Martha Moeller, who, who is a uh, retired Presbyterian minister, considers herself a part of this congregation long distance. Hi, Martha. And to all those who are watching at home, your prayers are heard as well. And thank you for being with us this morning. And so in all the ways we've been taught to come out of the shadows in prayer, perhaps the first exit the shadow prayer that Jesus taught when he taught his disciples how to pray. Let us pray in the way we learn that prayer. Together, saying, We welcome your offerings at this time and invite you to place your prayer and information cards in the basket.
This table is set for everyone. There are no shadows on this table, just light. God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God. were not forgotten. In the grateful hands of Jesus, the cup of wine turned up all the glorious things earth and light and water can do. And on the night before he died, surrounded by those he loved and trusted, he surely remembered these things and more yet to be known. Well, come on. Have a seat. You can stay. Why don't you stay with me? Sit back there. See if that works. He just wants to see what's going on. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. So there surely were children running around the table that night as well. And he's reported to have said something like, "Suffer the little children. Come on to me." And so he probably remembered all of that and more as he took the bread and he broke it. And he said to all of you, young, old, whoever, whomever you are, this is my body which is broken for you. When you break bread, remember me. When you do this, remember me. And then after a while, he lifted the cup. This cup is the new covenant that courses through my blood. Do this as often as you think, drink it in remembrance of me. In so doing, Jesus glorified God's love through it. His, as we come to this table, the same one really, may we do the same. Amen. Amen. And could we have the communion service come up while we sing the covenant? <laughs> So the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, the table is set for you.
Let's pray the prayer of thanksgiving in your bulletin and on the slide. We thank you for arms full of life, hearts full of love, eyes full of wonder. We hold our hands open to receive those you send to us. Our feet are ready to dance with the world, teaching and learning as we go. With minds hungry for what you will reveal and knees willing to honor the mystery, we come to you in these things and more, especially in remembrance of you. Thank you everyone who helps to make this morning's worship service possible, especially all of you. Are there any announcements for the good of the congregation that we need to make at this time? Sue's waving her hand, I wonder why. <laughs> Could you say that again, I'm sorry. Oh, Mars and Anne, thank you for your hospitality contributions. And thank you everyone for eating all those contributions. <laughs> Sylvia. Okay, we'll get that into the newsletter. Anything else? All right. So as we leave this morning, shadows are shadows because of neither darkness nor holy light. And so sometimes we're there. Sometimes we're there. The main purpose, I think, of today's reading and some of the comments is that we don't have to stay there and that they do not have more power over us than we need and have to move from them, if only over time with the help of others. So there's great hope and there's great promise in the light. And when Jesus said to Nicodemus, do you not know, I say that to myself and perhaps you think it as well. Remember who and whose you are and that in fact, the light never overcomes the darkness. No, the darkness. <laughs> That's why I'm human. The darkness never overcomes the light, ever. Go in peace to love and serve God and your friends in the light as you may. Amen. That's all right. <laughs>